And now if you'll remain standing for our scripture, which comes from Luke chapter 4. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is this not Joseph's son? Doubtless, he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And they will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut for three years and six months. And there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, All in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through them, through the midst of them, and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Have you ever been good and mad? Have you ever been hopping mad? Have you ever been mad as a hornet? I regret those times in my life when I let my anger get the better part of me because I was good and mad. Most of the times, it had to do with something that happened or was said to our children. Nothing will make us matter than if you hurt our kids or grandkids. Amen? I can remember a time that I was hopping mad. Our son, Ryan, was a sort of beginning piano student. And he had been working for some time on a song to play at his elementary school talent show. This was his first performance, and he signed up to play the song he had been working on. And oh boy, was I mad. Was I mad when the assistant principal called me and told me that he could not play that song because it was a Christian song. What was the song, Lori? The song was something about Christians. It's the New Orleans jazz song that they play during on the streets during funerals. I can't recall the title of it. When the saints go marching in, that's it. She told me that song was a Christian song and therefore he would not be able to play it in the talent show. 
Ooh, I was mad. But luckily, one of my colleagues, Tommy Mercer, who served a church nearby, was also on the school board. And when I had calmed down just a little bit, I called Tommy and I said, Tommy, can you believe what she has said? And he said, oh my goodness. Five minutes later, he called me and said that Ryan could perform that song and that he, Tommy, would personally be in the audience to hear it. I got mad another time that I recall. My father had a boat, and he used to allow us to use the boat when he wasn't using it on the weekends. And there was a boat, a bolt on the motor of that boat that would loosen sometimes. And you had to get down where the engine was and put the ratchet on it and tighten it up. I got down there, and of course it's a cramped space as it is, and I got it on the bolt, and I started to turn, and my hand hit part of the engine. And I was so angry, it hurt so bad, I was mad as a hornet. I was so mad, I took the ratchet off from the part on the boat. And I flung it as far as I could into the Rappahannock River. I watched the ark. And I heard the splash. And then I realized that the only way to start the boat and get home had just been thrown into the middle of the river. Luckily, in the end, the engine started. And I was able to get home. You've been mad, haven't you? You know what I'm talking about. And today, what I want to talk about is the alternative that Jesus offered. Jesus went home to Nazareth. They loved him because he was coming to preach. They loved him because he had grown up in that town. They were anxious to hear what he said. They knew him. They knew that he had built furniture for many of them in the synagogue. And he got up to preach, and he preached the truth. You see, they were a, a needy bunch of people, and they asked Jesus, can you perform your miracles and heal people here just as you have healed people in Capernaum? In Jesus, Jesus let forth with a tirade and quoted. Elisha and Elijah, who neither one of them healed people when there were sick people around him. And by the time he finished, they were so mad at him, they were hopping mad, they were mad as a hornet. They were so mad that they took him and drove him to a cliff on a hill outside of town and were ready to push him off.
what would you do in that situation? You'd probably be mad. I'd be mad if they had invited me to preach and that was the reaction I got. But Jesus was something else to them. In this passage, Jesus was not good and mad. Jesus was mad and good. Did you hear that? Jesus was mad and good. I don't propose to stand here this morning and tell you how to resolve anger in 10 easy steps. You can go to Barnes and Noble, or you can go on your uh, Kindle or other device to Amazon Books, and you can probably find 50 to 100 books that not only define anger, but tell you how to handle anger. But I bet very few of them are going to suggest that the way to handle anger is through love. The older I get, rather than doing something stupid when I'm angry, and it's not usually the main big crisis that makes me angry, a lot of times, it's the 10 little nitpicking things that happen in a day, and they all happen at once, and they have a cumulative effect of leading me to anger. When I'm angry, I try to follow what Jesus did. I try to love. I try to pray. I try to think what might be going on inside of the person that I'm angry at. And I pray for them because it's hard to stay angry at somebody when you pray for them. I find that those times that I am closest to God is when I am able to handle my anger the best. I have read this passage at just about every wedding that I have done. If I speak in the tongues of mortals, and of angels, but do not have love. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. 
But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I came, became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And love is the greatest of these. I'm not talking about the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love. I'm talking about all you need is the love of Jesus Christ. And for your heart to be filled with him and your anger will go away or be easily managed. The comedian Buddy Hackett once said, Never hold a grudge. While you're home holding a grudge, the other person is out dancing. My brothers and sisters, it is but human nature to be good and bad. But it is the nature of Christ to be mad and good and to go on with a heart filled with his love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.